Of our many early residents, Leslie C. Brand may have had the most profound influence on the city of Glendale. His vision transformed the small community's transportation and communication systems, its economy, infrastructure, real estate, and ultimately, its place in Southern California history. Although today it's the most visible reminder of the role he played, Brand Library and Arts Center is but one element of Leslie Brand's great legacy. Leslie Coombs Brand was born in 1859 in a small town in Monroe County, Missouri. He was one of several children of relatively prosperous parents. But when Brand was just 10 years old, his father died and his mother was left with several young children. Family history indicates Brand cared deeply for his mother Virginia and two sisters, Helen and Ada. He harbored some resentment towards his brother Joe, who chose to lead a gypsy life, but felt responsible for the son that Joe left behind. Joe was not the kind of person to stay put in one spot. Joe Brand was the younger brother, but he just couldn't settle down. Uh, in these days, you'd call him a black sheep of the family. He left my grandmother and my father and took off for the gold rush. When he was 20, Brand went to work in a recorder's office in nearby Moberly, Missouri. And he did so well that he soon opened his own real estate office. He married a young woman named Lulu Broughton in 1883. But sadly, she died just a few months later. Following the death of his wife, Brand headed to California. Brand left Missouri after his wife's death, and he moved to Los Angeles, which was experiencing a land boom. He teamed up with a man named E.W. Sargent, and they formed the Los Angeles Abstract Company. This was at the corner of Temple and New High Streets in Los Angeles, and this was in 1887. Leslie Brand convinced my grandfather that the gold to be obtained in California was in the land and in the services to be provided to the people who were going to come, and they ultimately did. Well, he returned to Missouri to settle his wife's estate, and when he came back, he brought with him his mother and his two married sisters. They were Ada Stalker and Helen Dryden, and they all lived together on South Main Street in Los Angeles. Brand had speculated on oil in the Saugus area when he first arrived here, and when that investment failed and a recession set in, Brand and Sargent sold their company, and they sold it to the fledgling Title Insurance and Trust Company. Then he left for Galveston, Texas to join other investors who were buying up real estate in that area. Leslie Brand decided he could go down there because no one knew where any titles were, or property lines or anything. He tried to talk my grandfather in going with him. He said, well, go down to Texas and we'll make a fortune. While he was living in Galveston, Brand met a young woman named Mary Louise Dean, and they eloped. They went off to Monterey, Mexico, and they were married in 1891. To fill his time, Brand took a lot of long walks and he wrote a lot of letters. And he wrote a letter to his mother describing Galveston's main street, which was called Broadway. And he told her it was 150 feet wide with a parkway down the middle. He had been to Galveston, Texas, and had fallen in love with the wide avenues there. He went to Galveston and he saw you know, what the big civic leaders were doing there. He liked the look of the place, and I'm sure the wheels started to turn in Galveston. And when he came back to L.A., he set his sights on Glendale with a view to doing some of the things that he saw being done in Galveston. Three years later, Brand returned to Los Angeles. He was a married man with a grand carriage and money in his pockets. After returning to Los Angeles in late 1894, Brand formed another title company with former partner Edwin Sargent. Two of the officers included Henry Huntington, president of the Los Angeles Railway Company, and Herman W. Hellman, president of the Merchants National Bank. By 1898, he was living in a house in Angelino Heights with family members and others, including a man named Dan Campbell, who eventually became Leslie's close friend. During this period, Brand formed the San Fernando Mission Land Company, and invested heavily in real estate. He got involved in the abstract business, title business, and formed a company which later became Title Insurance and Trust Company. He was in the title business, 
He was uh, president of Title Guarantee and Trust Company. Leslie Brand was aware of the vast potential that existed in the Los Angeles region. His work in the title business taught him that real estate and development investments led to profits, but he also understood that infrastructure was vital for a community to prosper. And obviously he could see the potential in California, the Golden State, moved to LA, understood the building booms that were about to happen. The opportunity for business expansion and for making money and participating in the growth of Los Angeles would have been very clear by then. He was not alone, right, because you have enormously powerful and rich people who have now come to Los Angeles. By the end of the 1890s and into the turn of the century, he would have had very good company. He would have been an insider in a small group of people who were beginning to build and basically own the city. Well, he was one of Glendale's first entrepreneurs and, uh, and came into Glendale with a swath of money in his pocket. Successful businessmen in those days were empire builders. You didn't have government regulations to a great degree. You didn't have income tax. You went out and did it on your own. You may have failed and you were broke. But those are the type of people who took that kind of a gamble. And I think that's what Leslie Brand had. By the time you get into 1900, the, the, the really great period in California, uh, what's considered sort of this golden years, is this period of 1900 to 1910. You are in the great moment. And people who were here, why would they leave? You have the railroad that comes in. You are beginning to have water. You have all of the super infrastructure that makes it possible to live here. And he clearly had a great uh, sort of an entrepreneurial idea. As somebody who's obviously an entrepreneur and interested in building things, it would have been a very logical moment for him to stay. There was a population here and it was a developing place. Uh, the climate was wonderful. It was out in the country. Uh, the views of the San Fernando Valley were spectacular. The key before you ever acquired land and could develop it, you had to perfect the title. And you did that through an abstract, through title search and so forth. And he did this for other people. And then he realized what they were profiting. In other words, you could buy a, a piece of property or a farm for, say, $10, $12 an acre, $15 an acre. And by laying it out and putting streets and getting your uh, permits and so forth, suddenly it was worth an awful lot more. You hadn't really done much to the land except lay it out on paper. He also bought up a huge piece of the San Fernando Valley, which he sought to develop. And I think that he was certainly influenced uh, financially by the, the thought that the railroad could come through and then make its way over into the San Fernando Valley. He convinced Huntington that we needed to have the railroad come up from Los Angeles and, uh, and then divert over into the San Fernando Valley. In 1887, when Glendale was first recognized on the map as a town, there were about 300 people in the community. No gas or electric lights, no private telephones, no automobiles, no high school or library, only one church and a blacksmith shop and a meat market. By 1901, residents of Glendale, Tropico, Burbank and Eagle Rock had formed a high school district and a year later built a high school on what is now the southeast corner of Brand Boulevard and Broadway. It was named Glendale High School. This was the community before Leslie Brand became involved. Through his efforts, an electric car line came to Glendale and the San Fernando Valley Home Telephone Company was established, which served Glendale, La Crescenta, La Cañada, and other communities. Shortly after, he formed the Glendale Light and Power Company and two water companies. What he did to build up the infrastructure of the city um, on all levels was pretty remarkable. He was a very uh, motivated, directed type of person. He didn't have to have people tell him what to do. He saw things and what he wanted to do and he went out to do them. But he also had as enough of a gregarious or pleasant personality that he, one could sell to he could make very influential friends. 
He was the type of person, obviously, who liked uh, stimulation, liked risk, liked to speculate, liked to be strategic. Uh, and he was able to do that because there were so many things to do. You know, Glendale to him, I'm sure, when he saw it first laid eyes on it, was a big blank slate waiting to be written on by him. For a long time, residents of the valley had been dissatisfied with the services of existing railroad companies. Edgar Good, who had unsuccessfully been trying to obtain a franchise for the line to Glendale, teamed with newcomer Leslie Brand, who had already been acquiring land for the right-of-way. In March of 1903, Brand guaranteed that an electric road from Glendale to Los Angeles would happen and backed it with a personal check of $10,000. He then organized and became president of the Los Angeles and Glendale Railroad Company, with the initial priority being aligned to Glendale, but with future expansion to Burbank, Pasadena, and Griffith Park in mind. When the first electric car ran from L.A. to Glendale, it opened a new era for the city. April 6, 1904, is an interesting date that's probably the, the Glendale version of the opening of the Transcontinental Rail Railroad, and that was the date that um, the Interurban Railroad ran, uh, made its first run through Tropico up to the Glendale Terminus. And that is really a watershed date because that's when the linking of Glendale by rail to the rest of Southern California kind of symbolically had its start. At the celebration of the line's success a few months later, Brand said, in driving through the Elysian foothills, I conceived the idea of building this, the most scenic road in California. I interested H.E. Huntington, and I sold him one half of my holdings in this vicinity. It is our intention to make this valley bloom as the rose. I made the proposition to the people of Glendale and Tropico that if they would furnish a free right-of-way, I would build this road or forfeit a $10,000 certified check. I believe that I've done my part. Brand insisted that the right-of-way for the electric car be 120 feet wide and one of the finest boulevards in the state, and that the street be named Brand. It connected Glendale with the area that was then known as Tropico. Brand bought up a lot of land and began to develop the, the city, per se, of Glendale on Glendale Avenue and Brand Boulevard. And uh, he saw Brand Boulevard as being this wonderful main street in the city with the broad avenues. He acquired the rights to the land on which the Interurban Railway was going to run, which was what eventually became Brand Boulevard, and the land on either side of it and he was very instrumental in fostering the expansion of the Interurban Railroad and connecting Glendale with the rest of Southern California. Automobiles were rare in the first part of the 20th century, so this new public transportation gave the growing community of Glendale a big boost. The opening of the interurban line allowed development to happen along its route, and Brand himself initiated this by constructing the first brick buildings near the corner of what is now Brand Boulevard and Broadway. The first National Bank of Glendale opened in this vicinity just a few months after the Bank of Glendale opened at the intersection of Glendale Boulevard and Wilson, the original town center. Leslie Brand started the second bank in Glendale, the first national bank, and he appointed Dan Campbell as the vice president of that bank, and vice president and manager of that bank. There was some soreness about the fact that a lot of the initial business leaders who had really put a stake in and an investment into the area around Glendale uh, and Wilson that was earmarked to become the commercial center of the city were miffed about the fact that Brand uh, almost single-handedly moved the Central District over to what eventually became Brand Boulevard by developing the land uh, for the Interurban Railway and commercially developing the adjacent strips on either side of that rail line. Glendale was originally laid out to be on another street, but Leslie Brand laid out the tracks and put them up this open stretch of land which he now called Brand Boulevard and that's where the businesses went because the trolleys were there 
And some of the people in Glendale were, I understand, somewhat irritated because they were the established founders and Brand, in a sense, moved their town by moving the railroad over. He helped develop synergy between Glendale and Tropico that ultimately resulted in the two combining in, into one municipality. So even though he wasn't a, a citizen of Tropico per se, and he's identified with Glendale, clearly he, he fostered the integration of those two um, growing municipalities into one city. After the electric car, known as the Pacific Electric, came to Glendale, a flood of activity happened in the city, instigated by Brand and his business associates, who subdivided their land into small town lots for building. The Glendale Hotel went into foreclosure and was purchased by Brand, who resold it to the Seventh-day Adventist for a small profit. The hotel was then converted into the Glendale Sanitarium, which eventually brought recognition to Glendale from across the country. The fact that he had purchased um, the Glendale Hotel, which was that very elaborate uh, hotel that sat on Broadway uh, where the police station is today, and eventually was sold by him to uh, the Seventh-day Adventists for a hospital sanitarium, and eventually that became Glendale Adventist Medical Center. He could see the value of having uh, a hospital and, and a medical center in Glendale. He also helped finance other buildings, including the Masonic Building in 1910 and the Elks Building in 1917. By 1904, Brand's San Fernando Mission and Land Development Company owned 20,000 acres in the north end of the San Fernando Valley. Through the company's efforts, the Pacific Electric Line was extended to this area by 1913. But Brand still had more to accomplish. Early on, prior to 1905 in, in that area, uh, Leslie Brand started the Glendale Light and Power, the water company, and the home telephone company. And the home telephone company reached out into the San Fernando Valley, where of course he had property. And he appointed Arthur Campbell to be the manager of these companies. Glendale Incorporated in 1906, which led to sidewalk, street, and building construction. The first city officials included real estate investors and large landowners, and some of the town's original settlers. After incorporation, two independent water companies were taken over by the new municipality, and Brand offered his electric and power company and Miradero Water Company to the city. In 1906, Brand installed stone posts along Brand Boulevard, topped with electric lights. He began planning a country club to promote the social aspects of the growing community. The club opened July 4th at the corner of Brand and Wilson Avenues and hosted numerous social events where Brand himself was often the guest of honor. Brand and his associates continued to improve Brand Boulevard between 4th Street, Broadway, and the foothills, spending money on paving, curbs, and tree plantings in the quest to make it the most picturesque boulevard in Southern California. At the same time, they were subdividing their land holdings in the foothills, creating desirable residential neighborhoods. The major draw to this area in the north was the Casa Verdugo restaurant, heavily promoted as a tourist destination and utilized by Brand as a stopping point for visitors to see the available building lots. The restaurant was housed in the former adobe home of Rafaela Verdugo and her husband, Fernando Sepulveda. Meals were served on the veranda and at tables beneath the pepper tree and in a banquet hall with electric lights. Special car service was provided by the Pacific Electric Line. In Glendale at that time, much of the business uh, transpired, business decisions and whatnot transpired at a place called Casa Verdugo, which was a Spanish style, wonderful looking restaurant. Um, somewhere near the top of Brand Boulevard and Mountain Street. While he was busy with transportation projects, Brand scoured the foothills for a place to build a summer residence. 
and he found the perfect location one day when he was out hunting with a companion. And this was a very beautiful and prominent perch that at that time, at the turn of the century, he had all to himself and in fact put the first uh, piece of property up there and made it quite an exquisite and unusual piece of property to boot, which eventually became a social center uh, for entertainment and society in Glendale and the surrounding areas. I think he just really latched on to the natural beauty of the area. He loved the view, he loved the whole place, he loved the mountains and the naturalness of it. He finds an extraordinary piece of land, right, because he looks out over the city and he looks down the at San Fernando Valley. So the sighting of this is exceptional. At the 1893 Chicago World's Fair, Brand had been attracted by the East Indian Pavilion. When he started building his own house in 1902, he used a design influenced by his visit to the fair. The architect was his brother-in-law, Nathaniel Dryden. The house was finished and occupied by 1904 and became known as Brand Castle. It was surrounded by running streams, waterfalls, and tropical shrubbery that gave the estate a fairyland appeal. Glass from Tiffany's and mahogany woodwork were but a few of the embellishments that the home featured. Over the years, Brand expanded the lush grounds, and in 1911, he added a tower addition to the house to serve as the master bedroom. If we could stand there and look up and see this house up here, Grand Castle stuck up <laughs> uh, all over the place. The East Indian architecture was chosen to express Brand's view of the picturesque. The white walls, the towers, and the minarets of the structure were surrounded by terraces of green lawn, and together they highlighted the grandeur of the surrounding rugged mountains. Since he went to the Chicago Fair and um, saw the Indian pavilion there, and he wanted a house like that. He wanted a Moorish looking house, a Moorish Indian looking palace, if you were. And it was, I mean, Brand, this was always known as Brand Castle. California itself was very well suited for Moorish architectures because it's less that it was Moorish, it's more that it was attached to a Spanish tradition because it's really, one could think of this as Southern Spanish architecture also because of the Moorish buildings that, are, that populate the, the southern part of Spain. He could have built a much more conventional colonial revival house, he could have built a neoclassic uh, a building which was becoming very fashionable in the period and was really the taste of wealthy businessmen in the period, but he doesn't do that. The approach was through a gateway of stone pillars with a metal arch spelling out the house's name, El Miradero, and then along an avenue bordered with orange trees and shrubbery and up terrace steps to the wide veranda with its tiled floors. A huge fireplace dominated the entry and the drawing room and the music room opened up on either side. The dining room had a really large window providing a panoramic view of the valley down below. And every room opened onto a central solarium. And when the house was built, this was an area without a roof. And potted plants and ferns lent a tropical flavor to the place. I do remember the solarium, and that enchanted me. It was a big room with glass ceiling, plants all over the place, and a fountain. And I thought that was just magnificent. There was a solarium that had a fountain in it and, and glass ceiling and um, lots of ferns. The dwelling had five bedrooms and the interior featured hand-carved wood and leaded glass windows silk damask wall coverings and frescoed ceilings, and according to a relative, six pianos and blue carpeting that you sang into when you walked. You do see this interesting split in this house between what the outside is and the exoticism of the outside and the deeply late Victorian sensibility of the inside. So my guess is that you have 
a couple, and I believe she grows up in Texas, and she probably brings with her this fairly conservative and conventional late Victorian taste. And my guess is that there is that kind of conversation, which is, we'll do the outside this way because this seems a suitable uh, for Los Angeles, or the, at least this, this region. However, when we get inside, I'm not going to live on a banquette on the floor. You can read something about the brands by looking at the outside of the house versus the inside of the house, because they're not totally connected in their sensibility and their decision making there. Outside there was a miniature lake and it held goldfish and there were splashing fountains and all provided a serene contrast to the rugged mountains that were all around the house. The swimming pool was up above the tennis court, just a stone's throw, and uh, it was quite uh, large as I remember it, at least 50 feet long, and it was made of um, glazed tile. He had palm trees planted so they all you could follow them over to this uh, northwest Glendale area where Brand Castle is. And if you look to this day, that is true. There are palm trees going up and down streets that possibly existed at that time. Brand enjoyed hunting, fishing, and vacationing, especially at his home at Mono Lake. By 1909, he began to slow the pace of his business pursuits and engage more heavily in recreational, family, and social activities and a more relaxed kind of life. He was often the guest of honor at the elegant social events of the Glendale Country Club, many hosted by the Tuesday Afternoon Women's Club. In 1911, he fell ill and had an operation, but recovered and resumed his community service, even playing Santa for the neighborhood children. He and Mrs. Brand hosted many festive dinner parties at their home. Brand was short and stocky, and according to those who knew him, he was very self-conscious about his height, and he wore a tall, broad-brimmed hat to create an illusion of height. He also greeted guests seated whenever he could. He, he was a short man with a long torso and short legs. So I remember as a, a child, uh, I thought he was small. Uh, he had a rocking chair that he sat in, in front of the window in the dining room, and look out that big wind, Tiffany Winnie. He'd sit there in this little rocking chair, and it had short rockers. That was his favorite little chair. Uh, I have that in my living room. But one of his employees, Gilbert Budwick, described his boss this way. He was a short, broad-barreled, skinny legged man. Many people were intimidated by him and referred to him as boss. I called him Mr. Brand. Glendale uh, was and has had the reputation of being a relatively conservative kind of staid place and when you look at the activities of Brand especially uh, in the Victorian era he was uh, uh, quite a colorful and adventuresome person having these fly-in parties and uh, uh, being interested in, in automobiles and banking and entitlement and land and celebrity and everything. He was uh, quite engaged in life and living life to its fullest. He had some nice horses. He had a beautiful black, an Arabian. He had several horses and he would ride uh, back uh, up and down. He'd go up the canyon on his horses. Mr. Brown was very much into um, aviation and cars and automobiles and horse racing, so he was very much of a fun person. He was just a really good, smart um, businessman, and I think was fair in, in all aspects. My dad said some t one time he had property that he was renting, and someone got behind in his rent, and and he asked if Mr. Brand would forgive some of it, and Mr. Brand said no, he couldn't do that, because of course it would set a precedent. He just said, pay me when you can. Family was very important to Brand, and he always helped them in any way he could. He invited his nephew, who was living in Canada, to come to Glendale. 
He provided a home for him in Glendale and created a job for him at the Title Guarantee and Trust Company. As his niece tells the story, Uncle Les and his wife, Mary Louise, had no children. And Uncle Les and Mary Louise were very fond of their nieces and nephews. So Uncle Les asked my father if he and my mother would come south to California. Now, all this time, my father was raised under the name of Burton. Uncle Les wanted my father to come to California and resume his birth name of Brand. So he and my mother eloped, married, and came south. And I believe they lived with uh, uh, Uncle Les and, uh, and Mary Louise briefly. Brand reserved Sunday afternoons and holidays for family gatherings. He had no children by either his first wife, who died soon after their marriage, or by his second wife, Mary Louise, but he was said to be very considerate and very generous to his extended family. Through my research of the file, as you see sort of the more personal side of him and Mrs. Brand, of being very close-knit with the family, I just recently read that he actually required the family to come every Sunday for lunch and activities on the, the grounds. Christmases were very memorable here. That's where the family members came. They were also very fond of pets. They had lots of dogs, and the dogs are actually buried with them in their cemetery on site. He delighted in having friends of his extended family romp in the hills above the castle, and he invited them to swim in the enclosed swimming pool and to play tennis in the nearby court. One ritual of the family gatherings was to churn ice cream made with homemade berries and to serve it with dinner. Christmas was an exciting time at El Miradero. A huge Christmas tree was brought into the mansion solarium and presents were piled around it. And the story goes that the presents were so high that you could barely see the Christmas tree. Brand owned one of the first automobiles in town and he was often seen touring the city streets in his national. Although Brand loved his cars, he quickly realized that a car wasn't going to meet all of his needs. He had a lodge near Mono Lake and it was a torturous 12 to 16 hour drive with a lot of mechanical breakdowns and flat tires and he thought it would be just great if he could get up there before daybreak. He would fly up there, and as he told an interviewer, I want to catch a nice mess of trout and fly home in time to cook them for dinner. The trip could be made in three hours each way, leaving four hours for fishing. Mr. Brand had this uh, uh, car they called the Tioga Wolf that he used to go up to uh, his summer camp in Mona Lake. He tells about all the problems he had on one trip something like three or four flat tires, and, and it took him uh, the whole day to, to get home. Bran wanted to be able to commute by air. That's how uh, the airport came into being. He, he decided that he was going to be an air traveler. He visualized being able to fly off his own, right from his doorstep to wherever it was he wanted to go. Uh, that didn't work out quite that well, but uh, it, it, it came pretty close to it. There was flying going on at Griffith Park from, from about 1910 um, up to, till the war began, and uh, Brand would certainly have been aware of that. That probably may have been his inspiration for the idea. Brand ordered a custom plane that would climb the Sierra Nevadas so he could land near his lodge. He acquired several landing sites along the route and purchased 15 acres below his Glendale estate for a landing strip. He insisted that the strip be close so they could fly right from his home, even though pilots had to land uphill and take off downhill regardless of the wind. The problem with Brand's airport was it was not well suited for an airport. It was a downhill runway, which uh, it, it wasn't uh, certainly an ideal location. One story is that when he got his first airplane, he asked his chauffeur to, to fly it. And his chauffeur hadn't a clue as to how to fly an airplane. So he convinced Uncle Les to, to get uh, someone, a pilot. Brand thought that he could uh, uh, have his 
chauffeur trained to fly the airplane. He thought anybody could learn to fly, but uh, Pomeroy, uh, he didn't really take to the idea. He and his new pilot made their inaugural flight on July 4, 1919. Well, they headed first for Bakersfield in order to deliver some newspapers to that city. Well, they encountered tremendous winds and that made landing in Bakersfield very difficult and the winds continued as they flew north. By the time they returned, Brand decided the plane didn't meet his needs after all, so they retired the plane to the new hangar and only used it for sightseeing trips. Then he ordered a plane that was described as the finest, costliest, and most luxurious plane ever built. Brand's new airplane brought him lots of press and lots of visitors. Aviation buffs, people like Eddie Rickenbacker and Frank Hawks and Jimmy Doolittle came to visit. Celebrities including Mary Pickford and Tom Mix and Cecil B. DeMille flocked to Brand's estate to sign the guest book and to enjoy the well-stocked bar in the clubhouse. The military was there from time to time. I think I've heard that just about everybody who was prominent in military aviation on the west coast at any rate, was into Brands Airport at one time or another. He didn't fly planes, but he was fascinated enough in aviation to go up in planes and to hire a number of pilots to pilot his planes. And he collected a number of uh, planes from World War I and a variety of different vintages, and he kept them on his property. Early in the spring of 1921, Brand sent out invitations for an aviation luncheon. No one was to be admitted unless they came by airplane. And local flyers as well as Army and Navy officers were invited to the April 1st event. That was held on April Fool's Day, 1921. And the guests had to arrive by air, one way or another. The invitations had a picture of the Brand Air Strip with the T marking the spot where the airplanes were supposed to land. Plus there was a map instructing flyers on how to find the narrow runway and how to make a landing. The Glendale Evening News kept readers up to date as plans for the party progressed. It announced late in March that James W. Horn of Valley View Road had been granted exclusive rights to take motion pictures of the novel luncheon. The story made its way across the nation and even across the Atlantic. On the morning of the event, airplanes began landing on Brand's air strip and his pilot, Mr. Budwick, was flying Brand's airplane, escorting the first arrivals to the somewhat treacherous runway. Motorists were driving up to watch the proceedings and uh, Mr. Horn and other photographers documented the arrivals and the pilots thrilled onlookers with a display of stunts before landing and again later as they flew off. I remember my mother saying that they took her up in one of the planes and did loop the loops. <laughs> she didn't like that a bit. My father didn't go up at all. There, it was famous. I know my dad said he didn't think he they would ever have another one because uh, after they had been at the, uh, at what he called it, the clubhouse up there uh, and imbibed a little bit too much, why they did some pretty tricky flying <laughs> he said, afterward. And he, Daddy couldn't understand why some of them didn't have an accident. Nearly a hundred guests sat down for lunch and the party lasted until 4 p.m. The luncheon will go down in history as one of the greatest bits of publicity Glendale might desire, said the Glendale Evening News. Shortly after, he fell ill and the disease which had been previously diagnosed as cancer took over. He spent his last days at home preparing his will, which deeded his property to the city and the people of Glendale. On February 14, 1925, the city council accepted the deed to approximately 800 acres as a gift from L.C. Brand and his wife. It was to be known as Brand Park and intended for public use and eventually for a public library. The arrangement stipulated that 30 acres of the land would be retained for Mrs. Brand until her death. The deed was officially accepted by Mayor Spencer Robinson, who called Brand the father of Glendale. He gave the city its start, and he has done much for its growth, said Robinson. 
deed restrictions or a restriction upon his conveyance to the city that it always be used as a library and a park area uh, that would bear his name, so, or the family name Brand. Despite its fame and fortune, Brand did not enjoy a long life. During the summer of 1924, when he was in his mid-60s, Brand learned that he had terminal cancer. Brand had been spending the summer at his Mona Lake house, but he returned to Glendale to see physicians. His fast-paced life changed abruptly. And faced with the inevitable, he began divesting himself of his properties. He sold most of his airplanes. By this time, he was no longer able to climb the stairs to the master bedroom, so a room next to the parlor was converted to a sick room. Brand died on April 10, 1925, in the early hours of the morning. His wife, Mary Louise, and her brother, Charles Dean, were with him. The funeral was held at his home, and Brand was buried in the cemetery behind the house. During the funeral, a plane dropped flowers over the long processional. It was a, just a sad time for us all, I do remember. The local newspapers, including the Los Angeles Times, all printed lengthy articles praising his accomplishments. The Glendale Daily Express printed a memorial edition that same day with commentaries and interviews. And his friend Dan Campbell, who lived on neighboring land, said that Brand's death meant not only a distinct loss to Glendale, but it means the passing of one of the closest friends I've ever had. An editorial in the Glendale Evening News said, During the early years of Glendale's existence, he was its foremost and often its only booster. His absolute faith in the city carried it over many discouraging slow periods. When, had it not been for his indomitable spirit, Glendale might have passed off the map completely and ceased to exist. There was a huge public funeral and it was held at his estate and more than 1,500 people made their way to the mansion for the service. The house was filled with beautiful flowers, particularly roses, and the overflow crowd spilled out onto the veranda and down the broad lawn and even out onto the street below, and autos lined the streets for blocks. A great magnolia wreath occupied the center position on the casket. It was given in the name of the people of Glendale. I remember the, the flowers that he received at the funeral, They're just trucks of them. They took truckloads of flowers to the hospitals. Brand was buried on a knoll above the house. The casket was borne to the family burial plot in the automobile, which had been his favorite for 16 years. It was the one that had carried him to and from his summer home in Mono Lake. In a private service, his body was laid to rest next to those of his father and his mother and other relatives. When Uncle Les died, the castle became the home of Mary Louise until her death. After Brand's death, Mary Louise lived a quiet life. No parties, but she traveled a lot. She died on October 15, 1945, on a motor trip to St. Louis. The Brand mansion and surrounding property immediately passed to the city of Glendale. She was there, sort of hidden away, and uh, until 1945. It seems like she did maintain a more quiet life after he passed away, and less activity, um, and probably focused on being in the house. She traveled, and she lived well. Um, she had a, a big car with a chauffeur. She was killed in an automobile accident. She wasn't able to keep a chauffeur very long. So it was her gardener that was driving her when she, she was taking, he was taking her east on a trip where the accident happened. The city officially opened Brand Park in 1926. After the death of Mrs. Brand, the house was to become a library, so most of the personal possessions were passed on to nieces and nephews. 
Some doubt was expressed that the city could maintain the library on the 10,000 per year that had been estimated. A 1948 bond election, which would have provided additional funds for the upkeep and library conversion, did not pass. The heirs to the estate then moved in to regain title, claiming the city had failed to live up to the terms of the deed. After several years of disagreements between the two parties, a judge ruled in favor of the city but also ruled that the house must be converted to a library by February 1956. Restoration work began in 1955 utilizing a plan to retain the building's original character and in 1956 the house finally did open as a library. The house was given to the city of Glendale and they weren't doing anything to it. They weren't keeping it in good condition, there was a vandalism, there were cracks in the walls, there were windows broken. There were a lot of things happening because Glendale didn't uh, maintain it. So one way to force them to maintain it was to say, you don't want this, we'll take it back. But it wasn't really because they wanted it. It was just to force the city of Glendale to do something. Through the 30s, the city did some cooperative master planning efforts with the National Park Service to develop this the entire uh, canyon area plus uh, the area that we have today uh, that's developed as uh, approximately 31 acres worth of uh, area uh, that are developed. Through the 50s they developed the um, library and also the grounds around the library and, and more facilities to, that are truly park facilities. And later in the 60s, the tea house and friendship garden. One interesting part was the solarium, um, the center of the, the building acted as a gallery and a recital hall and didn't have books and bookshelves as it does today and then in the later 60s, it realized that that space wasn't enough and there was a, a very much of an interest to have the city expand their arts outreach and have more space for, for gallery works and um, music recitals. So the addition was built on in 1969 and that houses a um, full art gallery and a recital hall. The art collections range from fine arts, architecture, painting, drawing, sculpture, design, and various visual arts. The city of Glendale did a wonderful job of, of turning it into a library and then adding the music and art center to it and in maintaining it. That has enriched uh, the city of Glendale immeasurably. I think it's quite a, a jewel to the city. I'm, I'm certainly happy it wasn't brought, torn down. And <laughs> Having all of that in one location and inside of an architecturally significant house as well um, is, is definitely unique and special for Glendale and also for the, the history of Glendale that this still exists and can still be used and Brand's legacy continues. Leslie Coombs Brand did everything within his power to help the small settlement of Glendale get the boost it needed to become something bigger. The city couldn't have asked for more. The Los Angeles Times called him the Empire Builder of the Southland. He was a colorful character, a man who had to have the fastest horse, the first automobile, the first airplane. He was a pace setter in all that he did. Here was a man, for good or bad, who did a lot for this community and there are very visible signs that he was once here. Not only the castle, but the park and the boulevard and all the other things. And uh, I think it's, it's correct that we should, we don't have to venerate them, but we should at least recognize that these people were there and what they contributed to us. I think we can thank Leslie Brand for opening the door to this Glendale area and its development. There will always be the, the stories and the history to look back at and to, to figure out. And then we can 
you know, tell those stories or tell that information to the patrons that come in that want to know more information. I really have wonderful memories of, uh, of him. And he was just a real nice person. He was a very nice person. He created something extremely unique here that simply wouldn't be and would make Glendale a lot more ordinary if it wasn't for that being there. And we have him to thank for that.